and uh, the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. <coughs> so today, <coughs> sorry, today I will be talking about uh, tilings of spaces and the mathematical theory behind it. So I'll start by uh, giving a few pictures of tilings and then try to classify in a mathematical way how different tiles are different and then increasingly I'll define what a group is or like a symmetry of a tile is and eventually I'll uh, try to reach the kind of work that I do but uh, only in a very non-rigorous and um, heuristic way. So let's start. So this is a famous kind of tiling of the wall from Alhambra, Spain. Tilings have been used by mankind for, for long enough to you know, tile roofs or tile roads or walls. So this is kind of a triangular tiling, if you can see, you have kind of a, this kind of these triangles, curvy triangles, and you have these stars. And overall, it looks like it has some kind of translational symmetry and you can rotate it three times. Uh, and it, this, this curve, I mean, this, this, this picture does not change. Of course, there are colors, so the colors will change. But if you abstract out just the geometric pattern out of this image and not the colors that are there. Uh, so these kind of things are called tilings. So example, so this is a kind of triangular tiling, famous tiling. Another tiling that uh, you, you see everywhere in India, uh, particularly in villages, the rooftops. So you have here, you can see kind of a square tiling. Each of the tiles are square or rectangular and you tile uh, a, a part of the plane or in this case roof using these tiles. Now this third example will be a bit more interesting. It uh, will not exactly be a tile in the sense that it is covering the whole space, but uh, here you are. So this tile is from a mosque in Portia. And here, if you can see, these yellow things are sort of tiling the, the plane, but you have gaps. These, these black places are kind of gaps and you can't fully tile the plane with these yellow tilings. But still, why am I considering it as an example? Because later on, we will see that these are, uh, I mean, this, this gives to some interesting geometry. Though we will not talk about it in details in this talk, but I will mention something about it. So these kind of patterns uh, later gave rise to quasi-crystals and uh, Penrose tiling. So you might have heard about Professor Penrose's name who got the Nobel Prize this year for, uh, I think his study on black holes or something like that. But yeah, he's also a mathematician and so these tilings are on him. But uh, historically, people knew about these tilings, maybe not all the rigorous mathematical details about them, but Persians certainly knew something about it. So what are some non-examples that uh, these kind of things that I will not consider in today's talk is you take this kind of um, this haphazard uh, tiling of a wall. So of course, this tiles the plane, but here the, the different tiles, there are no symmetry among them. I mean, one is small, one is big, one, is, one looks like a square, one looks like octagon, irregular shapes. So we will not consider these kind of tilings. So another example, you see again, irregular shapes. Uh, another example, so this one, you do have regular shapes and it looks like squares and rectangles, but then there is not uh, enough pattern here. I mean, it might look a bit appealing, a, mo a bit more, less organized, uh, uh, more organized than the previous two non-examples. But even in this case, uh, it's not too symmetric for our taste. So today we will be talking about uh, symmetric tilings or periodic tilings. So, so what is a periodic tiling? So you have kind of the tiling pattern repeats itself. Uh, as you go along, it repeats itself eventually. So here you see a triangular tiling, the, the similar 
same thing. We have abstracted out the first picture that uh, we had shown in the previous slide. And then uh, you have a uh, tiling by squares, which we have abstracted out from the second picture uh, from the rooftops. And here you can see kind of a, a square symmetry. Uh, previously, there was a triangular symmetry. And even in nature, you find this kind of symmetric things, not only uh, man-made objects, but here you have an insect, uh, bees. So bees have this, uh, their, their home looks like a hexagonal tiling. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, now you might wonder in your mind that you, you have seen triangular tilings, uh, we have seen square tilings, and we have seen hexagonal tilings what happened to the pentagon or for that matter uh, what happens to the heptagon or octagon or uh, higher n-gons do they not tile the plane well they do not uh, tile the plane but for the pentagonal case something interesting happens uh, the thing is if you try to cover the plane with the pentagon you will see that uh, there will be gaps and if you are very clever, like uh, Professor Penrose, you will see that you can tile the plane in such a way that the gaps that you get, I mean, the portion of the plane that is not getting tiled by the pentagons, regular pentagons, they uh, are not any random shapes, but uh, come from a finite collection of shapes. Like you can see here, you have this uh, yellow diamond shape or this kind of a uh, blue half star shape and this green full star shape. So this kind, these things are uh, omitted from the plane and the rest you can cover via this kind of pentagons. An interesting thing is that which does not happen for heptagons and octagons and higher objects is that uh, these gaps, they do not come, they do not follow some finite pattern. So it only happens for the, the pentagon thing and this uh, pentagonal tiling gives rise to some quasi periodic tiling so it's like it's periodic but it's i mean it's not periodic but it's almost there i mean nothing repeats in a larger scale but even then uh, it does not look too haphazard too random so there is a systematic study of these objects and uh, you can instead of tiling the plane using this kind of pentagons you can think of uh, breaking this uh, space up uh, using this kind of darts, uh, not darts, but these two kind of rhombuses. And this gives you a aperiodic uh, or quasi periodic tiling of the plane. And these two pictures are equivalent. I mean, this this pentagonal tiling, which does not tile the plane completely and tiling using this kind of two distinct rhombuses. This tiles the plane completely and they are, uh, they are kind of related with each other. And in fact, this is not something uh, which is coming from the figment of a human being's imagination. Uh, they do exist in nature. So you have this kind of a crystal which was found in Russia. And now I think it's kept in a museum in Florence. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a crystal which, is, which comes from a meteorite and it's called a cation kit. I am not sure how you pronounce it correctly, but that's how I pronounced, uh, I, I never heard it pronounced before. I, I, it's written K-H-A-T-Y-R-K-I-T. So how do you know that these are uh, uh, quasi-periodic crystals and not periodic crystals? Is that you, you, you find this scattering uh, plot of it, uh, I mean, it's, um, uh, so you send rays through its atoms and see this scattered plot and you find 10, I mean, order 10 symmetry. And the thing is that for periodic tilings, you never would get an order 10 symmetry. Like here, if you count the number of lines coming out from the center, you will see there is 10, I think. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So 10 never ha happens. It should be like order of 3 or 4 if it's a periodic uh, crystal. So having this 10 pattern, 10 fold pattern tells us that this crystal is uh, quasi-periodic and this happens in nature. So these are interesting things. Now I will digress a little bit and uh, talk about 
the thing I formally say what uh, I just said in the pictures before and then uh, say something more about this kind of higher n-gonal tilings. So as we have seen, planar tilings exist by triangles, square and hexagons. Planar almost tilings by pentagons lead to quasicrystals. And uh, planar almost tilings by higher degree polygons give nothing interesting. I mean, this kind of quasicrystal quasi kind of behavior is not found for uh, higher uh, gonal tilings. But even then, there is some pattern, and uh, we will come to that now. So interesting patterns. First, we remember, I mean, we recall that if you take the sphere, and if you consider the longitudinal lines or the equator to be uh, the straight lines of this uh, sphere, then there are no line parallel to a given line passing through a given point outside it. So that's so that means that the Euclid parallel postulate is not satisfied on a sphere. And it is not satisfied via that there are no lines parallel to a given line. So all the straight lines eventually intersect with each other. And so why, why are we talking about this? Well, the sphere can be nicely uh, tiled using the triangular tiling with three tiles meeting at a vertex or a square tiling with three tiles meeting at a vertex or the pentagonal tilings with three tiles meeting at a vertex. So we keep this thing fixed that we will, we will only allow three tiles to meet at a vertex, not more, not less. So then the, the tri I mean, tilings by three gons, I mean, triangles give you a sphere by four gons that give you a sphere two, five gons give you a sphere two. What about the six gons? Well, if you, if you see, the six gons will give you a plane and planes have exactly one line parallel to a given line passing through a given point outside it. So the plane satisfies the Euclid's parallel postulate and uh, hexagons give you tilings of the plane. So that's an interesting pattern. So what happens for the seven gun? We have already seen seven guns don't uh, uh, tile the plane. And it also does not tile the sphere. If we restrict that, you know, you can't have more than uh, these three tiles at a vertex. So what happens with the seven gun, eight gun, nine gun and blah, blah. So interesting pattern two you get uh, something called the hyperbolic disk. And this disk has a very weird geometry. It, in this geometry, you have given a straight line and the point outside that straight line, you can have infinitely many lines parallel to the straight line passing through this point. So this kind of geometry is called hyperbolic geometry and it's modeled on the hyperbolic disk. And so uh, what happens with the hep heptagon? You see that heptagon style the hyperbolic disk. So here you see this is heptagon. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are seven sides. And this kind of neatly is styling up this disk. And you might wonder, okay, but these shapes are getting smaller and smaller. And uh, is, isn't that cheating? Well, the thing is, it might look from our perspective that the shapes are getting smaller and smaller, but one can define a notion of distance on the disk for which the shapes are not getting smaller and smaller. It's because uh, like if we see an object from far away, we see that object very small, even though the actual shape of that object has not changed. In a similar way, in this picture, the, the heptagons towards the boundary of the circle are looking smaller and smaller but that's because of our perspective. They actually are not getting smaller and smaller. Okay. So how about octagons? Well, we see octagons also give you tilings of this hyperbolic disk. So you count this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
in fact, uh, this happens for 9 gone, 10 gone, 11 gone, and so forth. In fact, it happens for the infinite gone. So whatever that means. So which means that you have this kind of a, this, this kind of a tile with infinitely many sides. You know, it almost looks like, a, you know, your uh, uh, blood vessels on your heart or something like this. But yeah, so these kind of patterns do come up in biological uh, places. So this is kind of infinite and infinite side tiles also give you tiles of the hyperbolic disk. So, so seven, eight and henceforth gives you tiles of the hyperbolic disk. If you uh, restrict that, you know, uh, three tiles meet at a single vertex always. So sort of, uh, somebody has yes. a question. Yes. Pratik. Uh, prof uh, professor, um, the, so I didn't understand. Um, uh, so uh, we've given patterns on the disk. So does the uh, job, like the disk uh, geometry change as well? So like, is the, I don't understand how there's infinitely many lines parallel to a given line. Like how, how do we visual, how does that change just by uh, changing the tile in? No. So, okay. I'll start by this is that uh, the way we are going is that we start with a triangle and we allow at a vortex three more triangles and we try to keep uh, gluing things up and we end up with a sphere. We okay. glue, uh, uh, you start with a square and you glue squares and with the, uh, with, with the restriction that at each vortex you will allow three and you glue and you see that it again gives you a sphere. For okay. pentagon, it again gives you a sphere. And all these first three objects, the sphere has a specific kind of geometry where these any two big circles, they intersect at two points. Okay. Now, if you start with the hexagon, you start with the hexagon and you start with again, you start with the hexagon and at each vortex, you want three more hexagons and you will allow no more and you right. go forward. And that okay. way you will see that you develop this full plane. It never carves up. It never carves okay. up. It gives you the full plane. Right. And the plane has this interesting property that you give in a straight line and a point outside. Uh, there is only one straight line parallel to it. We have school, I've seen this in school geometry. Right. Okay. Now, the question is, what happens for the heptagon? I start with a seven gone. I again, at each vertex, I allow that I will glue three more, I mean, two more heptagons. Right. And I do this and I go forward. What happens? Okay. So this will again never carve up. It will go towards infinity, but this won't be a plane. If you try to do it using pieces of paper, you will see that you will not be able to flatten it on a plane. It okay. will become like a frock, you know, like a, like a lehenga. Okay. It will, it will have this kind of curvy patterns. So this, he says these curvy patterns are hyperbolic patterns. So if you see from a bigger, a far away distance, this will close up to give you a disk. The boundary of the disk is not there. The boundary of the disk is actually at infinity. Okay. 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 And this will again happen. May I also ask one more question? Uh, so sir, uh, when we, we are yes. having like triangles uh, as uh, covering sphere. So per unit, the number of triangles will be fixed. Similarly, if we are taking squares, then to cover a, a given size square, the number of uh, squares will be fixed, right? Mm -hmm. So for five also, it will be some. So what are those numbers for triangles? How many triangles do we need to com uh, com uh, give, uh, complete a sphere? Oh, interesting question. Triangles. For triangle, uh, there are three different ways you can do it. Uh, one is coming from the tetrahedron, which will give you four faces. Uh, another is, comes from the icosahedron, which I don't know how many faces there will be. I mean, one can count there. For sphere tilings, you only have finitely many ways of doing it. So that's a deep result, which was known. Uh, maybe it, maybe the proof was not known to Plato, but uh, certainly Plato knew this result and the proof was done maybe later. So they are called platonic solids. I mean, they have some relation with platonic solid. They are finite in number. Uh, when you come to this hyperbolic disk, things can go wild. 
in the plane things go semi wild and and because there are finitely many post pattern i mean you don't find any pattern as in what i mean is that when you have infinitely many objects then it makes sense to find a pattern among them if there are finitely many objects you can just cook up a pattern whatever pattern you want uh, like i don't know i mean so it's like what does what does one mean by a pattern one means by a pattern is that you can fit some curve via those data points or some kind of a, either a straight line or a cubic or a cubic line or a square line or something like that uh, for finite objects it's not worth enough to find patterns if if that answers your question yes sir it does thank you sir okay. yep uh now we will go forward and interestingly uh, one shouldn't be disheartened so this kind of people from antiquity thought the euclidean plane was the only geometry available in this universe rest other geometries are like there are no more geometries in fact famous philosophers as recent as uh, kant immanuel kant he it seems claimed that there is no other geometry than the euclidean geometry but science has a way of surprising us and uh, here you have this hyperbolic disk geometry which is a non euclidean geometry as in the parallel postulate does not hold here neither does it hold for the spherical geometry but uh, in this talk we will not uh, speak any more about this so kant was wrong more details on it some other day so in today's talk i will move forward for with planar tilings okay so now we will try to classify planar tilings using its symmetry group but what is a symmetry group so symmetry is a transformation which keeps an object fixed so that's kind of we know intuitively what a symmetry is and we are trying to give a kind of semi rigorous definition of it and uh, so we see we start with this triangle how many symmetries does the triangle have uh, we see that we can rotate the triangle so from the first picture to the second picture it's uh, rotated towards the left by 60 degrees and you get the third picture on top by rotating it uh, by 120 degrees and the first green picture you get uh, by reflecting this triangle Uh, via a line passing through a and then again you rotate this triangle and you get the other two pictures so we see that uh, a triangle has six fold symmetry okay so because there are 1 2 3 4 5 6 6 six fold symmetry moreover symmetries of an object satisfy this uh, nice properties uh, what are those properties so the identity is a symmetry of course i mean if you start with the object and you do nothing else with the object you just keep it fixed hello sorry did anyone ask a question yeah i think you should say equilateral triangle oh yes equilateral triangle yes 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 thank you uh so for this equilateral triangle you have a six fold symmetry uh now symmetries of any object not only the equilateral triangle but any object satisfies this interesting properties is that you have the identity identity is a symmetry you have the object and that's it you you do no transformation that's the identity transformation that's a symmetry of the object if you have two symmetries if you have then the composition of those symmetries like you do a transformation of the object it stays fixed you do another transformation of the object is again stays fixed then if you do the two transformations together then the object is fixed too that means composition of two symmetries is also a symmetry and uh, inverse of a symmetry is also a symmetry what is inverse of a symmetry you have you have an object from here you do a transformation you get some another object now if you started with this another object and did a reverse transformation uh, you would get the initial object so if the initial object is the same as the final object then the final object is also the same as the initial object so which means inverse of a symmetry is also a symmetry and in fact any set 
which satisfies these properties, they are called a group. It's a mathematical word, nothing too fancy about. It's just, and maybe not even a very interesting word, like, uh, yeah, maybe a bit confusing. But yeah, any set which satisfies these three properties or any elements of that set, so you have identity in the set and uh, whenever you have two elements in the set, their composition is also in the set. And if an element is in the set, it's inverse is also in the set. Uh, that's called a group and the set of symmetries of any object uh, forms a group called the symmetry group of that object. So now we will try to classify our, uh, this planar tilings using their symmetries. So the, uh, we call Euclidean transformations, the set of symmetries coming from rotations, reflections and translations. And why it's called Euclidean? Because it preserves the Euclidean metric, which means that it does not change the, the shape or the size. So if you rotate an object, uh, its shape or size does not get changed. It does not get long lengthened or shortened or something like that. And if you reflect again, its shape and size does not change. If you translate, shape and size does not change. So Bieberbach in 1912s or something like 100 years ago, he proved that uh, the symmetry groups of periodic tilings of Rn, like in case of R3 or R2, you consider periodic tilings, you do not consider the aperiodic tilings, like the Penrose tilings that I was describing before, we do not consider them, we only consider periodic tiling. Then up to a finite error, uh, if you only allow rotation, reflection and translation, then the symmetry group is this kind, z power n, like n copies of z, product of n copies of z. So what do I mean by finite error is that uh, the different symmetry groups will uh, differ from each other via a finite group. So Zn is an infinite group because the integers are infinite in number. So if you have symmetry group of two different periodic tilings on Rn, uh, then these two symmetry groups will differ from each other via a finite group. So we can kind of say that in the long run, this finite thing does not actually matter and it's essentially Zn. So you might wonder uh, how do you, so we had this triangular tiling, the square tiling and the hexagonal tiling of the plane. How do they match up? I mean, they were different, they look different. So here is a picture and I'll try to give a proof of this picture. I mean, proof via picture, why these three tilings are same. So you can see that the triangular tiling joins up to give you this kind of a hexagonal tiling. And not only that, these hexagonal tilings in a, in kind of in the long run gives this kind of block rectangular tilings. So the pattern, if someone sees from uh, far apart, they will not be able to distinguish between uh, if they if they do not have a fine resolution in their in the apparatus that they are using, they will not be able to distinguish between a triangular tiling or a square tiling or a hexagonal tiling. They would all look like this kind of a mesh, a kind of uh, a, a square tiling in, in, in the large scheme of things. So what essentially means is that all these tilings will fit up. So something to be, uh, two tilings to be completely different, if you put one on another, they shouldn't fit up. Like here the, the triangular tiling, the square tiling, I mean the, the rectangular tiling and the hexagonal tiling, they, they all matched up. So if you have some kind of matching up, then you say that up to a finite error, they are the same thing. Okay. So this happened, this classification happened for uh, uh, Euclidean transformations. Now, people wondered, particularly Auslander in 1960s that, okay, so uh, Euclidean transformations, you do not have much scope. You only get Zn up to a finite error. Uh, what about we change, I mean, we do not have much freedom in Euclidean transformations. What about we, we use any linear transformation, you know, affine transformation, that is any linear transformation and you have, a, you, you can translate. So by linear transformation, I mean, I mean, things can become, uh, uh, things can either lengthen up or shorten or they can rotate 
or they can shear you know they can shear so this kind of transformations if we allow all these kind of transformation linear transformations and the and the translations do we find different symmetry groups and oslander and marcus found out that yes you indeed do find uh, more symmetry groups in particular this group for which i i was not able to uh, create a picture it took a long time i was trying using this matlab but uh, sorry for that I wanted to include a picture of these two. So the group generated by uh, identity comma V identity comma W and AU is a symmetry group of an affine tiling on R three. So this gives rise to affine tiling where A is this upper triangular block uh, one 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 matrix, and uh, U is the uh, is zero zero one V is zero one zero and W is one zero zero. You can see V uh, W V U, uh, and this identity is I is this identity matrix. So if you do this, if you if you play with it, and you will see that this tiles the plane, but uh, this tiles the three space. But for this tiling, the tiles change, but they change using a pattern. I mean, for Euclidean tilings, all the tilings were looking same, but here the tilings will be distorted but distorted by a fixed thing it cannot be distorted like random distortion distortion via a linear transformation and they observed that this above group is isomorphic to uh, z semi direct z cross z it's kind of almost similar to uh, direct products of copies of z almost there but not quite you have if you have not encountered the semi direct product you can think of it as almost the direct product so not too far from beaver box example and so they conjecture that uh, for affine tilings also uh, this should be true like the symmetry groups of periodic tilings of rn under affine transformations are essentially this kind of semi direct product of n copies of z i mean they found one example and they thought that this was the only distortion that is possible and they made a conjecture that's how maths kind of uh, go forward but unfortunately it turned out that this was very difficult to prove i mean in fact for dimension i mean in bigger than 6 dimension this conjecture is still unproved in fact if you prove this conjecture you might get some You know, big math prizes. You know, you become a famous mathematician. So this conjecture, seemingly looking uh, not so difficult, is actually a pretty difficult uh, conjecture. People have not been able to solve it yet. So people tried uh, to kind of make it easier. This make this conjecture easier. So what did they do? They observed. Okay, we were working with compact tilings. That means. our tiling the tiles that we were using were finite how about we use infinite tilings maybe that makes things easier to find the symmetry group uh, in the affine okay. case professor so one we, question yes yes uh, what exactly is a comma u and like uh, is that like a mat matrix or um, i'm not familiar with the notation oh okay sorry so i'll go back and i will tell you what it is so a comma u is you use a linear transformation multiply a vector in three space by a and then add the vector u that is your transformation okay i comma v means you apply the matrix i which is identity matrix that means you do not change the starting vector then you add the vector v okay. and i w okay. is can i not yes can i interrupt so yes so the point here is that you look at the point in rn yeah that point is represented by a vector yes so how the point moves is given by this that's what he is telling you yes yes okay okay yes so think of r3 as you know 3 by i mean 3 tuples of real numbers and uh, yeah so i will go forward so now if you consider non compact tiling that means you allow not finite shapes but infinite shapes so again 
the symmetry group of non compact periodic tilings of rn under euclidean transformations are essentially product of k copies of z or k less than n so here you can find i mean you can see one in r2 so for the plane previously we were showing squares but now you can see like this parallel lines so here this long slabs these are the the tiles the tiles are this long infinite slabs and uh, you attach the slabs next to next and that tiles the full plane so this is a non compact tiling biberbach's theorem says which he proved in 1912 100 years ago that uh, it's 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 pretty simple it's like z power k and so margulis using oslander's conjecture uh, he thought uh, maybe oslander conjecture is very difficult to prove maybe we generalize the conjecture so either you have a stronger theorem if it's proved or it's easy to get a contradiction so he conjectured that uh, symmetry group of non compact periodic tilings of rn under affine transformations are essentially uh, semi direct product of k copies of z okay but uh, within 10 years of this conjecture not even 10 like 5 6 years of this conjecture margulis grigory margulis who is a fields medalist a famous mathematician he showed he came up with an example and said well milner's conjecture is false and thus he became famous so why it's false he actually constructed examples where he found out that the symmetry group of non compact periodic tilings of rn under any affine transformation can be non abelian uh, under affine transformations can be non abelian free groups so they are not copies of z anymore i'll explain in a minute what is a non abelian free group i'll give a picture but non abelian free groups are very very far from uh, symmetries coming from copies of z copies of z you can think of them as squares kind of but a free group is something very weird looking as you can see here so what is a free group here i'll explain try to explain the picture so you have uh, if this identity element at the origin then you apply element a and you have two generators a and b Uh, so you can have a a b a b square a b cube and it goes like this so each of these uh, leaves of the tree gives you different uh, i mean each each of the nodes of this tree gives you different elements of the free group and there are no relation between each, i mean different elements of this free group like for z you have this relation that a plus b is b plus a that is but for free groups you you do not have like ab is not ba so ab this is ba this is ab they are different points and they have kind of become exponential but you can see here the the hyperbolic this kind of picture is coming and all these things are related uh, i will not be talking about them in this talk but just have in your mind that they are related things and you will eventually see if you walk long enough in your mathematical journey so uh, so this is a non abelian free group and uh, so this kind of this thing goes on okay so this is at every node you have three more at every node you have three more and goes till infinity so this is kind of a it's called a kelly graph of a free group of two generators so the symmetry group of non compact periodic tilings of rn uh, have this kind of symmetry so this is very surprising this is very surprising and that's why this kind of spaces are called margulis space times so yes. those sorry hello any question there are four thing like uh, we were saying that point there are three branch but then uh, there are four branches from first from i oh, yes 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 sorry sorry there there there, there are four branches I, i stand corrected there are four branches uh, yes so in this picture there are four branches at every point there are four branches one three going forward quote unquote and one going backward sort of yeah okay 
You're right. You're right. Thank you for correcting me. Uh, so yes. So these kind of spaces are called Margulis space times, whose uh, tr uh, symmetry group is a free group. And uh, these kind of spaces have this this really interesting um, geometry also. I'll, I'll draw more pictures. So these pictures. So Todd Drum in the 1990s, he worked hard and tried to create more beautiful looking pictures of examples uh, given by Margulis. And uh, he found in R3, this kind of uh, tilings of R3. So here think about these leaves, this kind of crooked leaves as the boundary of the central tile. Okay. I'll give another picture so that things become, I mean, it looks nice. Uh, so this is a this is a view from the side, okay. And this is a view from the top. Are you with me? The 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 fundamental domain or or like the 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 main one of the tiles of this tiling is the is the space between these four crooked planes, okay. And here this this, this space between the four crooked planes. This is the space that tiles are three, under uh, the symmetry group. Uh, which is a free group, free non-abelian group. So, so these are very really interesting, uh, nice, and still weird-looking pictures. And later on, so recent, the yes. Sorry. So, uh, so the tiles are two-dimensional, right? I'm seeing uh, the tiles here are still two-dimensional. Uh, are they three-dimensional? No, these, these are boundaries tiles. of the tiles. I'll explain. So previously, oh, okay. if you had a square tile. The boundaries of the style were these lines. Okay. Now right. you have a three-dimensional tile, a kind of a solid blob. Then you will have its boundaries, which will be given by planes. Right. So here right, you have right. openings. Yeah, yeah, got it. Got like it. Those, those parallel slabs, uh, their boundaries are these total planes. Here you have this kind of a crook, I mean a slab which has these crooked sides, four sides. Think of think of it that you have put cement in between, and you have got right. a solid blob in between. That's uh, the tile that you will be use using to tile the the, the three dimensional space. So the the the, the colorful images but, that you see here, they are the boundaries. Okay. Uh, you, you're fine. Okay. You, you're, okay. Okay. So uh, recently, Dan Seeger, Gerito, and Castle they found i mean they, they proved i mean this is a this this paper was published in a very good journal so they proved that every marble space time admit a fundamental domain bounded by crooked planes which means that any example that marble is constructed so not only so what dram did was he constructed uh, these pictures for a few of the examples so recently it was proved that any example that was constructed by marble admit uh, this kind of tilings this kind of tiling by uh, which which is bounded by this kind of crooked planes this was proved by Danziger Gerito Castle and uh, in fact last uh, in the last ICM Castle gave a, a talk invited talk about uh, this subject uh, yeah so now I'll come to a few results that uh, I proved uh, later in recent years, uh, I mean, working on previous works by Dram, Goldman, and Inkan Kim, you know, people like them. It's kind of rigidity. So what's this rigidity? It says that if the lengths between the pointy ends of the respective crooked planes uh, coming from the tessellations of two different Margulis space times match up, then the Margulis space times are congruent. So, okay, I'll give a picture and then this this, this long sentence will become more tractable. So what I'm saying, so you have, you have one marvelous space time on the left, another on the right. Let's say they are, these are to start with different marvelous space times. And then you compute the length between these, these pointy ends. So in, the, in the crooked plane, you had this kind of two planes, and then you had this kind of a triangular region, a triangular region, and then there was a point, a vortex kind of a thing of these planes. You join lines between all possible vertices. So here you have only four planes. So you get 
how many one two three four five six six uh, joining lines but you you will have more planes because you have tiles right so you will have infinitely many such uh, tiles and you you join all these lines and uh, so that will that will give you uh, i mean so so different like lengths between two different pointy length i mean pointy uh, ends of these tiles these crooked planes and you check if the lengths of these guys match up with the other one corresponding length so for this diagonal line you check the other diagonal line or the boundaries i mean the boundary line of the square here the boundary line of the square you check if these two lengths are same and if they are same for all these uh, lines joining the pointy ends for the different marvelous space times if the length lengths match up then the marvelous space times are congruent as in one can just rotate or do something uh, trivial operation to reach from one to the other they are not very different from each other like we said the hexagonal tiling and the square tiling were not different from each other in a similar way if these lengths match up then they are the same thing so you can think of this theorem as kind of a generalization of a very basic theorem that we did in our high school is that given two triangles if all the sides have the same length then the, the side 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 theorem then these two triangles are conjugate to each other they're congruent with each other so this is a theorem that we learn in euclidean geometry in high school so this theorem is kind of a higher dimensional more uh, involved version of this sss theorem from school so yeah so this this was proved Uh, in its original version by Graham Goldman, and then in a generalized version by Inkang Kim, and recently in a far more generalized version by me. So now, question is: Previously, we saw, like in Biberbach's case, uh, Euclidean tilings. I mean, tilings using Euclidean transformations, having Euclidean symmetry group. There are not much; only one. You know, z power n or z power k. Finitely many tilings. Not too many options. now the question is how many marvelous space times are there so how many uh, affine tilings are there uh, which is coming from this kind of free group how many are there so are they finite are they infinite or what are they so again uh, it was answered for by goldman laboratory marvelous and also a few years ago by me and nicolas trai in a joint work that the collection of marvelous space times can be parameterized by an open ball inside some appropriate vector space just think about you know kind of a blob inside some vector space so all points in the blob give you different different marvelous space times like different symmetry groups previously in biberbach's case there were finitely many choices so even if a uh, a uh, uh, a famous painter like picasso came even then he will not be able to find new symmetries because there is a mathematical restriction there are only finitely many symmetries that are that you can find for euclidean uh, transformations but for affine transformations what this theorem says is that you have a continuum many different tilings it's very rich you know like different points on this vector space give you different completely different tilings so there are infinitely many not only infinitely many there are infinity is equal, equivalent to the infinity of the real line which is uh, one order higher than the infinity of integers if you have encountered these kind of things in your um, college years or maybe later in life you will encounter so there are different kind of infinities so integers have a different kind of infinity and the real line has another different kind of infinity so a more pictorial way of looking at it as you can think of this the space of marvelous space times like the collection of all marvelous space times they are kind of this kind of a blob inside some uh, vector space and they have this kind of foliation as in they have these leaves which are glued together and if if you zoom in those leaves then these leaves look like this kind of a cone a double cone and this double cone shape might vary and so you kind of glue all these double cones and you get this big blob and this big blob gives you all possible different uh, free group actions that uh, that that 
gives you affine tilings. Okay. And now question is okay. So there are too many uh, tilings of this kind. How different are uh, one from the other? Is there a notion of how different they are? I mean, in case the Bieber Bach theorem, they were essentially same. So everything was essentially same. So there was no uh, nothing called being different. In the Margulis space time case, you have found that, I mean, we found that there are, there are many different uh, kind of Margulis space times. Now the question is, can you give your point quantify, like given two Margulis space time, can you tell me how different they are? Are they very different or are they kind of close enough? Not same, but kind of close enough. So this means, is there a kind of distance on the collection of uh, this Margulis space times? And the uh, answer is yes, indeed, there is. And this was one of uh, the work that I did in my thesis. And it says, so I mean, kind of, you can use uh, the growth rate of the lengths uh, between these pointy ends, the thing I described, these pointy end lengths, lengths between these pointy ends. You, you see how, how fast uh, the number of, uh, I mean, so the, the growth rate of these lengths inscribed in a ball with respect to the radius of the ball. So you check how fast, if you take bigger balls, how fast the number of uh, uh, this kind of distance between pointy ends, they are growing. The number of them are growing. And also the growth rate of the ratios of respective lengths. So given two different marvelous space times, you, you take the ratio of these respective lengths of the same kind of, I mean, between the, the similar point and distance. And you take that ratio and you check how, what is the growth rate and you can, I mean, formally you can uh, calculate all these things and uh, using them, you can construct a natural distance to determine how similar or dissimilar two marvelous space times are. Okay, so this kind of metric is called the pressure metric. It, in fact, uh, this, this result requires a lot of ideas coming from physics, particularly thermodynamics. Uh, essentially, it's kind of counting this kind of uh, growth rate of this length of curves, and it has some relation with uh, physics and how gases behave and fluids behave and stuff like that. So yes, and uh, so what did we learn today? So what's the moral of this story? The moral of this story is that one's freedom is dependent on one's axiom set. So which means uh, while we were working with Euclidean tilings, Biberbach's theorem told us that there was not much to do. But now that we changed our uh, space of symmetry and included affine symmetries, uh, we got this huge collection of uh, affine tilings of planes and uh, which has this rich structure. So we have a lot of things to work on and also yeah, like the parallel postulate will give you, you know, different, more rich geometries. So when you are stuck, change your axiom set and you will get more freedom. Thank you. Okay, very nice talk. Uh, any questions? Uh, I have one question. Yeah, Krishna. Yeah. So is there any, any way of getting the uh, generators of this free group of a multiple space time, given the affine transformation. Uh, could you please repeat? I, I did not. Uh, so if catch. you are given an affine transformation, yes, that generates a symmetry. Yes. Uh, is there a way to obtain the generators of this free group? Oh yes, 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 yes. So, there is explicit way of uh, yes doing it. Yes. So can you give not... an idea of that? Okay. So what you do is. Um, so you take a cone. Uh, can you see me? I mean, yeah, it's important because I'm, draw, I'm making some uh, gestures with my hand. I can see you. Yeah. Ah, okay, good. So you can take this cone, like the hyperbolic cone. Okay. Uh, this, this, uh, this double cone, which is the, the zero set of uh, the quadratic form x squared plus uh, y squared minus z squared equal to zero. Okay. okay. So that gives you this cone. On the cone, you have this hyperboloid sitting inside. Right. Now, on the hyperboloid, you have uh, this kind of uh, free group action. Okay. 
like given by the tree uh, that I drew picture before. So you have this hyperbolic tiles. So these are given by actually the matrices that you will get essentially is like lambda one, lambda inverse, and some rotation of that matrix. And okay. then, so that will give you this kind of, uh, these crooked planes, which are tied together at the origin. Mm -hmm. uh, and that will not be enough because uh, you will not get a proper action because these things are tied at the origin. So to, to, to kind of declutter things at the origin, you add the translation uh, directions very judiciously. Okay. And what Marvelous uh, did was exactly that he showed that in certain directions, if one is careful enough, uh, then you can declutter this, this image, uh, like the crooked planes coming from. So what is, so on the disk, you have this uh, hyperbolic uh, the circles, I'm right. sorry, hyperbolic geodesics, giving you a fundamental domain. Mm -hmm. The geodesic touches the boundary at some place, you draw the right. tangent line from there. And on the mm -hmm. other hand, you draw the tangent line on the other side. Mm -hmm. And so from this disk, you get all these tangent lines and that gives you, a, I mean, on R3, that gives you a tiling. It's not okay. completely a tiling because at the origin, everything is tied together. So right. now you separate them. Mm -hmm. And that gives you this picture uh, that I, uh, wait, I'll again, wait, where, where is it, where is it? Uh, you can see my screen also, right? Yes. Yeah, so that will give you this kind of picture. So this picture here, if you, in this picture, if, if you think all these, uh, these pointy ends were at the same point, then mm -hmm. all these things will fit up and give you a, a, a cone. Right. Now, in this picture, the, 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 the pointy ends have been separated. Right. So along these directions, you translate along. And so explicitly, uh, it will be, you start with some lambda one, lambda inverse, and some translation whose projection along the eigen uh, space of eigenvalue one is non-zero. That will give you one element. And then you rotate mm -hmm. that element via 90 degrees and that will give you another element. And you use this to get uh, the full free group. Yeah. One of the examples. Professor, I also had a question. Sure. Uh, so I was just a bit confused of what exactly a Marguerite space-time is. And mm -hmm. the other question was, why um, is it called a space-time? Like, is there ah, okay. a relation? <laughs> okay, yeah, so, okay. Uh, so the, for the first question, can you be more specific? Like at which step um, did you use it? Yeah, so I, I understood how it, how it could look like. So like, just how did we get to the point of uh, Marguerite space-time? Like, we were looking at Cayley graphs and then we, uh, uh, I, I kind of lost, you lost you there. Um, okay. So what uh, we were doing was, so first we started with Biberbach's theorem and then we came to this affine tilings. And in affine tilings, we said that uh, Marvelous found a series of examples where uh, uh, the symmetry group was a free group. So because here I did not right. include more tiles. That's why you did not see the, the Cayley graph of this free group uh, coming into this picture. So you can okay. think of this as the first four nodes. So in the Cayley graph, you had the central fourth thing here and then the rest right. was there, right? right. So in this picture, you can think that this is only the central four node. And you can extend this picture okay. using all those uh, four at each vertex, four nodes coming out. So here you will get three more crooked plane like this. Here you will get three more crooked plane like this, three more here, three more here. And on the right, okay. it goes like this. On the left, it goes like this. On below, it goes like this. So the picture here is just the central square, the central cross, not the square, okay. sorry, the central cross. And you can increase this picture using the 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 uh, the Cayley graph that you see there, this kind of tree, and that will give you more cluttered and like a more rich uh, picture. But I did not uh, include all those uh, crooked plates. Okay. So uh, I I hope I have answered your question. Or yes, yes, that makes the sense. first one and the second one. Your question was why is it a space time? 
right? Right. Okay. So the right. point is, it's uh, so in physics, uh, people's understanding from I mean after Einstein was that there is not much difference between a space and time. They are just different uh, dimensions. It's like 4D, but the signature of the matrix is different. As in, uh, so if you have seen in physics when they when they study the time direction, they write the matrix on this this four-dimensional space-time as x1 square, x2 square, x3 square minus t square. The x1, x2, x3 are the normal distance in our three-dimensional space, and for the time dimension, they have a negative square. It's kind of a matrix, not completely. So whenever uh, uh, you have this kind of symmetry group where uh, you have this kind of a signature, I mean, a quadratic form with a negative signature is preserved, you call those objects a space time. In particular, the examples here constructed by Margulis, their linear part uh, sits inside SO21. Like rotations and reflections are inside SO3. Okay. okay. What is SO3? SO3 is all those linear transformations which fix identity. That is A identity, A transpose is equal to identity. Right. Now, if you consider all those linear transformations A such that A, J, A transpose is equal to J, where J is this block 1, 1, minus 1. Okay. Not 1, 1, 1. If you have 1, 1, minus 1, and you consider okay. all those A such that A, this matrix A transpose is equal to this diagonal one one minus one, then all these okay. matrices are called are represented by SO two one, and okay. this is the symmetry group of the actual. I mean, in in case of uh, our actual universe, the symmetry group is, is SO three one, but uh, here in these examples, um, the symmetry group that you get uh, that this the linear part of this free group stays inside is SO two one. And that's why you call it a space time because you have this negative uh, signature uh, of uh, like one freedom. Yeah. And that's why you call it space time. Not, not, yeah, not too, okay. not much there. But, okay. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, any other can I also ask a question? Yes, please. Yes. Please. Yeah. So uh, maybe I think. I can present my screen, uh, not a screen. Uh, is my, uh, this, uh, is, is this visible? I can't see you because my, uh, uh, my screen, okay. I'm sharing my screen. I can only sh see four guys. I mean, three, uh, Professor Bhatia, uh, uh, Professor Vandarkar and uh, myself. Okay. I, okay, okay, maybe then uh, I'll, I'll try and explain the question. All right, uh, so yes. basically what my question uh, was, yeah. that suppose, I was just thinking the other way around. Suppose yeah. give, it's given that some finite tiles have been used and they and uh, it has been like the entire uh, plane is covered. Mm -hmm. Some finite, when I say some finite, for example, maybe there are square, there are triangle or there mm -hmm. are hexagonal mm -hmm. uh, tiles used. We don't know mm -hmm. what pattern it has been used, like which, mm -hmm. what is the pattern exactly. Mm -hmm. But some somehow we have been able to cover the entire plane. We have yes. tiled the plane sort of. Mm -hmm. So can we can we uh, can we say that this is identical to like you know can we have a one one own two sort of you know bijection kind of with uh, uh, like you know a hexagonal or entirely like one plane so for example tiling with all the triangles tiling with all the squares or tiling with all the hexagons. I get so if I understand, I'll try to repeat your question and you tell me if I've okay, understood so basically it correctly. My, my, yeah, my, my question was like, suppose I have uh, infinitely mixed, like finite, finite uh, tiles, uh, number of different tiles, finite number of different tiles. Finite number of different tiles, okay. cover a plane. Okay. Right. So for example, triangle, uh, square, hexagon, right? Okay. Finite you allow all of them. You allow all of yeah. them. Yeah. Okay. In, in, like infinite number of them. And I okay. mix it them and then sort of spread it on the road or, you know, on a plane. Okay. Sure. And it, it happens as that, that it, it is like covers, covers the entire plane, right? Sure. Some sort of tiling is done for the plane. Sure. Sure. Now my question was like, given such, such a, such a tiling, now I'm reverse engineering it sort of 
trying to find out a pattern or maybe yes uh, like you know re re uh, study the tiling what sort of tiling is now right? sure sure reverse engineering so my yeah. question was it was that uh, if i were to uh, re read this tiling can yeah. i sort of always get a pattern where one i can say like okay this is basically a sort of uh, tiling which one could get from uh, hexagon only or maybe ah, okay. triangles only. the answer or, to like, yeah. Yes, I, I have understood your question and I do have an answer to that question. Uh, okay. Is no. And no. I have already given a picture which uh, kind of answers your question. So I'll, I'll repeat the That's picture true. again. Sorry. Okay. 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 So, uh, yeah, I, I, I did not uh, say it in great length, but, and maybe from the picture it's not uh, very well visible. You can see my screen still, right? You can see my screen? Yes. Yes. Hello? Yes, okay. we can. yes. So uh, in this middle picture below. Okay. Uh, in this middle I picture, you have this gray uh, tiling. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You have a you have this gray rhombus and this blue rhombus. Right. 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 And this gray rhombus and blue rhombus, they fill up the plane. Okay. But there is no apparent symmetry between them. There's no evident symmetry. Okay. There is no symmetry. So they're, they're quasi symmetric. So these were found and there is not one example. You have this, there is an array of examples. Uh, this was found by Roger Penrose. Uh, so <laughs> and people were surprised. Like, like you, you were, you were thinking that, okay, maybe I use different uh, tiles, I mismatch them. Let's say I use triangles and squares. Uh, and maybe then I, mm -hmm. if I tile the plane, eventually I, I'll see a square pattern or, or, a, or a hexagonal pattern or you know, some, some kind of a, right. in the long run, this, this using different tiles right. doesn't, give, doesn't do much harm. But no, be careful. I mean, right. there are shapes. For some shapes, what you are thinking is correct. So maybe, for the, the symmetric triangle and the symmetric square, if you do this job, well, maybe I have to, I'm not sure, check, I have to check because the angles, if they match up or not is something of an issue. But yeah, I mean, for some cases, it might give you the standard pattern uh, from the hexagonal or square or triangular tilings. But in some other cases, it might not give you. And uh, they are, Precisely this kind of tiling, the square, I mean, this kind of rhombus uh, tilings. You have used two different rhombuses, this blue rhombus and this gray rhombus. And you can tile mm -hmm. the full plane. And if you see as big you go, you will not see any pattern. Right. And not only that, it is also visible in the nature, in, in certain um, meteorites, I mean, certain rocks from meteorites, which have this pattern. So, right. yeah. So it's kind of pretty abundant mm. and stable also. Yeah. Hope I have answered your question. Thank, yes. you, sir. thank you so much. Sir. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Then uh, if not, let me stop recording and maybe we can just meet the speaker. Okay. I just want to hang on. So, uh, Sort of you can stop sharing now. Okay.